I'm Dr. Bill Adams. It's uh, great to welcome everybody to this uh, first of, of a series of webinars that we'll be putting on for the uh, Aesthetic Society. Um, really, obviously, in unprecedented times right now, uh, we all know why this registration is so high for this uh, particular webinar. Uh, it's going to be on coping with the citywide lockdown. Now, you might ask me in, in my 20 year career, if I ever thought I'd be doing a webinar, moderating a webinar on a okay. citywide. Uh, so I'm say so on that that um, okay. Uh, so, anybody that's on, what we need you to do is uh, any participant, please go down to the bottom of your screen and mute yourself uh, and also turn off your video because, in order for this, the quality of this to be as good as you can so everybody can hear. We need to make sure of that. Dave, let's go back to the one slide. I just uh, wanted to make sure that, I just want to introduce our panelists who've really kind of put together uh, information for you at, at a moment's notice. I really appreciate it. And I'll introduce them as they speak, but uh, you can see them here, Dr. Paco Canales and Heather Furness from Santa Rosa, Trent Douglas from Wren County, and Dr. Dave Sieber from San Francisco. So I think we'll have a lot of great information for you. And we'll, we will have time for question and answer at the end. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is I just would like to uh, really extend our gratitude at the Aesthetic Society for this partnership with Sientra, who offered very graciously to lend us this technical platform and help us coordinate these series of webinars that you'll be seeing over the next uh, three weeks. Uh, we actually have Blaine Hamilton, who's the director of Medical Affairs and Professional Education at Sientra, who's running Technical Director uh, tonight. So, um, Blaine, uh, thank thank you so much for your your help and partnership with us and putting on these webinars. And I'm going to turn it over to you just for some technical tips, uh, Blaine. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Adams, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, these are obviously very trying and important times for us all to engage as best as we can. Um, Zoom is obviously up in its stock price for a reason, and we're not the only ones using it. So really quickly, just want to make sure that all participants know how to make sure uh, and keep their video off and muted so that we don't have interruptions during the program. Uh, so here you'll see the buttons that you should see on your Zoom uh, control. So if you just roll your mouse, or if you're on an iPhone or iPad, just tap the the middle of the screen, you should see these buttons at the bottom left. Uh, the mute button uh, is really important and I can, I can mute from my side. Um, so just keep, make sure to keep muted and also keep your video off. Press that stop video if it isn't already. You should have a red line through it if it's off now and that's what you want. Um, then you'll also see a chat function. Uh, the chat function is really important because that's where we're gonna be collecting uh, questions throughout the presentation. Uh, go ahead and send that either privately uh, to me, Blaine Hamilton, or send to everyone. Uh, the everyone is probably easier, uh, so you don't have to search for it. And just go ahead and document your questions there and submit it, and I'll keep track of those. And then when we get to the point uh, Q&A, uh, we'll go through those as quickly as we can. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Bill, and let's have a great program. Okay, so thanks again, Blaine. Really appreciate it. So we're going to uh, get right into this. I think we have some uh, great information for you. I'm going to uh, start off with uh, Dr. Dave Sieber, who's in San Francisco, and Dave is going to give us a little background information on exactly what happened in the Bay Area. So Dave, thanks again, and uh, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Bill. So uh, I wanted to kind of talk about uh, the shelter-in-place mandate that went in place on um, Tuesday at midnight. I was seeing patients just like any other day on Monday, and one of my patients came in and said, hey, did you hear that we're going to have a shelter in place? And I was like, I don't even know what that means. So uh, basically what happened is in order to um, try to eliminate the spread of the coronavirus, uh, they basically uh, instituted something called shelter in place. And what does this mean? It means that you must shelter in place of your residence. So you have to stay home unless there's something absolutely essential that you need to do. So uh, I'll give you a list of activities that they say are uh, essential. People are still allowed to go outside and exercise. There was a CNN article recently uh, talking about someone who thought that we still had too much leeway um, in what we're able to do. You can see that it wasn't just San Francisco County that was affected, but it was actually Marin County, San Mateo County, Alameda, Contra Costa, and Santa Clara. Total population of about 6.7 million people. 
um, and the whole hope and um, San Francisco is known for a lot of things, but one of the things that they have tried to do is be kind of at the forefront of, uh, of doing social isolation to hopefully prevent um, spread of the coronavirus. So this is what's considered essential businesses, um, healthcare, uh, grocery stores and pet stores, food cultivation, so these are farms, uh, livestock, um, shelters, especially for homeless people, media outlets so that we can still get all the exciting news every day, uh, gas stations and auto repair so we can get, still get to and uh, from places. Although that being said, uh, the mandate also says that we shouldn't be traveling at all unless it's absolutely um, essential. Um, uh, banks and post offices are still open so we can get money. We can still send letters, laundry mats, of course. Uh, restaurants are still open, but you can't eat inside the restaurants anymore. So they only allow for pickup and delivery. We're still able to go inside the restaurants uh, and order something from a counter service wherever and then take it away, but you're not allowed to stay in, in the restaurant for any prolonged period of time. Food delivery services are still working. So, you know, Uber Eats, Caviar, that sort of stuff, so we can still get food. Um, and uh, airlines, taxis, and other transportation are still going, as well as home care services and child care. There were some limitations on child care. They limited the amount of the groups to just 12 uh, children, and the children need to be from the same group. So they really tried a lot to um, prevent this. Uh, one of the things when this first went into place is a lot of um, cosmetic surgeons or plastic surgeons uh, kind of felt like they were still exempt because uh, they're a health care provider. So they continued to. Um, you know, do Botox and fillers on people. And uh, the way that I read this is that this is really to uh, protect us. It's not only to protect us, but it's to protect all of our patients too. And um, I shut my office down completely. Um, I only see patients for post-op visits for uh, drain and suture removal. Um, all consultations have been changed to online uh, virtual consultations. Um, and then all non-surgical patients have basically been rescheduled until after the 7th. Because this mandate was in place from uh, last Tuesday until uh, um, April 7th, which is a total of three weeks. Failure, failure to comply um, results in a misdemeanor jail time. It says in the mandate that this wasn't uh, put in place to cause people problems, but it was just to let people know that this is something that the city is very serious about. So who's next? Well, currently um, Palm Springs has a shelter in place. Uh, Colorado County, which um, I was talking to Blaine earlier, I guess is the very, it's where a lot of the ski resorts are in Colorado. Um, and a lot of people have uh, been going there and spreading the virus because of skiing. So that has a shelter in place as well as Fresno here in um, the Valley in, in California as well. Um, de Blasio said something uh, the other day that New York might be next on the list. Um, and then I also saw an article today about Portland and then even just uh, today, uh, this isn't as much a shelter in place, but um, Philadelphia, or not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania basically said that all non-life-saving surgeries also needed to stop. So we're living in a very interesting time. Um, I can tell you that uh, everyone here is uh, doing well, but uh, we all kind of think this is going to go on longer than the three-week mandate that we have. And Dave, what's, and, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, so, so this is probably what we're gonna come out after this quarantine. I wanted to add a, a little bit of humor. We're gonna have unibrows, uh, exposed roots, uh, no eyelashes and poor fingernails. So uh, hopefully we can fare better than this. Just a quick question. Um, what's your gestalt on, on the people's compliance in, across the city with this? Um, I think uh, a lot of people, especially the younger generations, a lot of the millennials are taking this kind of as a joke. Uh, I've seen videos from uh, Florida where people are on spring break and they're kind of like, I don't understand why this is such a big deal. Um, but I think this really is a, a big deal. And even myself uh, originally didn't think that this was going to be that serious, but I, I think we need to really do as much as we can to stop this from spreading more. But um, I think in the most part, people are trying to be as compliant as possible, but um, just like anyone, we don't like to have our normal routines or daily lives interfered with. Okay, great. Well, let's move on. Actually, let's see what we've got with Trent. So Trent, are you, are you there with us? Yeah, I'm here, Bill. Thanks for okay. having me on this evening. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much. So, uh, uh, go ahead and, uh, take it away. Well, I think to dovetail on to what Dave was saying, uh, there are a lot of interesting things going on in the Bay Area here right now. Uh, in our practice, uh, there's three surgeons. We have 15 uh, ancillary staff, including nurse injectors. And 
we're set up with a uh, in-office surgery suite as well as a full med spa side. So as we were actually having these discussions on Monday uh, between the three of us uh, primary surgeons, uh, the mayor came on and made this announcement that we were going to be going into the shelter in place. So for us at that point, it became a very easy decision to just shut everything down. And then reflecting on things the last couple of days and preparing for this, I really thought there are four or five uh, big points to touch on. The first one is uh, patients. And I think it's very important for each practice to know what their patient mix is. I think we've all identified the over 60 population as being at the highest risk. And it's also important to know whether you're just strictly in aesthetics and med spa patients, or if you're going to be seeing some patients that have been potentially exposed uh, from hospital-based reconstructive or emergency room call uh, surgeries. One of the things that I think I've seen as a best practice uh, as far as some of the retail and grocery industries is having some senior citizen designated hours where that over 60 crowd can come in either at the very beginning or the very end of business hours uh, so things can be spread out a little bit. Uh, the next area is staffing. Uh, we all are going to want to know what to do with our staff. Uh, in our practice, we decided that we're going to uh, make sure that our staff is fully paid through this first three weeks of uh, mandatory isolation and, uh, and shutdown. After that, we're still talking about what the best uh, model is going to be for paying the staff and whether that's going to ask them to go into their paid time off or even take unpaid leave. Uh, there's lots of stimulus packages that are being talked about. So I think that one's uh, going to be a down-the-road decision a little bit. Uh, as far as if you have some difficult employees, now might be a good time to trim some fat in your staffing uh, and also get some projects done around the office. Uh, we made a nice list of uh, videos that we wanted to get done, uh, which require no more than one to two people in the office. The office is going to be otherwise empty. So any of those little lingering projects uh, can get, get done and you can uh, freshen up your video profiles as well. From business standpoint, Dave mentioned it. He's already doing it. We're doing it. We set up uh, telemedicine and virtual consults uh, through the office. Our practice manager is keeping track of those and then spreading those between the three surgeons in the practice. Uh, the staff was very busy this week as far as rescheduling operative cases that had already been on, uh, as well as moving our non-urgent follow-ups to after the 7th. Uh, I'm with Dave. I don't know that this three week is going to be the end of it. I think we might be into more of a four to six week or potentially even longer here in the Bay Area. Uh, as far as thoughts for scheduling or continuing to do surgery, uh, one of the things that we really focused on was where are anesthesia providers coming from and working. Uh, we contract with a group that provides services also at Marin General Hospital right next door where we know we have three documented cases of COVID-19. Uh, so that was a potential source for uh, the virus entering our office spaces of, with, through our anesthesia providers. So that really played into shutting down the office. Uh, as far as some specific areas, I saw uh, that uh, Beverly Hills and Santa Monica made specific reference to shutting down cosmetic surgery. And I think that extends a long way into really keeping the, the flattening the curve uh, philosophy in place. Uh, some of our non-board certified cosmetic surgery uh, folks that are in uh, concentrated in some of those areas, I think it really sends a message that cosmetic surgery uh, is also elective surgery, which is also at this particular juncture probably unnecessary surgery. Uh, as far as our communities, uh, we all, I think, take pride in being uh, active members in our communities. Uh, the consistency of message that we all have to send, our practice has chosen not to advertise for any or market any cosmetic surgery at this time, but rather our social media posts are going to focus on health, wellness, and safety. Uh, one of the things that really quickly came into play was our answering service, uh, whether we were going to transfer phones. Uh, to staff members and have them answer the phones, especially patients that we already have relationships with, uh, calling to reschedule, uh, or to uh, go through our info at uh, website. Uh, when it comes to recovering from all this, I really recommend uh, supporting our local businesses, those restaurants that David had mentioned that are doing takeout uh, food. We're going to need to support our local uh, businesses and our local colleagues so that when our offices are open, that are going to be ready and willing to come back and support us as well. 
So to wrap up with my little bit of time, uh, I just wanted to share a few of the things that we were considering best practices and have implemented in, in our practice in Marin. Uh, we set a once a week follow-up date for those patients that still have uh, sutures or drains in. We designated Wednesday as that date where we'll have a skeleton staff in place. Uh, those staff will be wearing uh, personal protective gear to include masks, gloves, and gowns. Uh, as well as lengthy appointment times to allow patients to come in, not have to sit in the waiting room, but right into their treatment room, have the appropriate treatment rendered, and then let them get out and allow us some extra time to clean up and uh, sanitize the rooms between patients. Uh, I think that uh, having a staff group chat and group emails uh, to facilitate communications is very important. And then lastly, just a little anecdotal thing that we saw in the office the other day is please watch your supplies. We, uh, we literally had patients stealing our jars of hand sanitizer and alcohol wipes out of the office the other day. So keep an eye on, on your supplies. Uh, that's all I've got to share tonight, Bill. I look forward to some questions in the Q&A later. All right. Thanks so much, Trent. Uh, that was great. I'm going to go back to Heather now. Heather's back with us. So, uh, Heather, uh, thanks again, and uh, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Now, we are now uh, shelter in place county as well, but before that happened, we were trying to decide whether to, to shut down our practice or not. Uh, we were looking for some guidance. We're a quad, uh, quad ASF facility. And I took this screenshot today. This is their guidance as of March 19th. Quad ASF does not dictate adherence to recommendations regarding case selection during this health crisis. And they recommend that we operate in a manner that is safe for patients, staff, and members of the community. So how do we interpret that? What is a manner that is safe for all? I've participated in several plastic surgery chat and email groups. And some of them will, will talk about monitoring their patient and staff temperatures. They can interview patients and staff regarding their possible exposure to COVID-19 and exclude them from, uh, from coming in. Uh, some will treat only one patient at a time in the facility. Of course, social distancing uh, should be used whenever possible. And then um, the question is, should you just open your med spa, close your surgery, or do the reverse? Or should you shut down your entire practice? So in that, we want to look at the decision tree to stay open or to, stay, or, or to close. Now, reasons to stay open in this time would be that the uh, American College of Surgeons and CDC have advised that there be no elective cases specifically for hospitals. But, you know, when you're doing uh, cosmetic surgery, aesthetic plastic surgery in a quad ASF facility, you're excluded from that. And patients want surgery and they love the time now to recover. Then there's the staff and overhead to pay. So there's a lot of pressure to continue to go. And besides when everybody has to shut down, then, then you can shut down. But there are reasons to close the practice. Asymptomatic staff and patients can unwittingly shed the virus. In fact, from China, there was an article published in Science that showed that four out of five uh, sources for COVID-19 were unknown because they were asymptomatic or so mild. So a lot of the people without symptoms or apparent contact uh, can be shedding the virus. Uh, so therefore, we can unintentionally contribute to the increasing COVID-19 numbers. There's always a risk of a take back, even though we, we have uh, good control of what we do, there's always a risk of a hematoma necessitating a possible nurse or an anesthesiologist. And of course, there's always a risk that a patient might have a complication requiring hospital admission at a time when the hospitals are dealing with skyrocketing uh, numbers of, of COVID-19. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to this recent Wall Street Journal article that compared two towns in Italy and their different responses. Both, both, both towns are just outside of Milan. When the 
first cases came in to Lodi, the town shut down and they had uh, police officers on the streets making sure that nobody was outside. Whereas Bergamo was slower to react. And you can see over a quick amount of time, Bergamo skyrocketed relative to Lodi in, in the number of cases. So as we, um, next slide please. So as we um, interpret the decision that we make today after a year and look back in our imaginations, if we stay open with caution, did anyone shed the virus within our practice? In other words, did we contribute to those skyrocketing numbers? And did our decision reflect poorly on our specialty as a whole? Because if we continue to do a breast augmentation facelift and Botox at a time during this pandemic, and there, um, there was a case that came out of our office that could reflect poorly on the entire practice, and would we have any regrets? Now, if we close the office, what would the economic impact be of closing our practice? Over a year is probably minimal because if there's a disaster, then we're going to have to shut down anyway. And more importantly, what is the impact on the health of the community? Did we contribute to the community the way that Bergamo did in increasing numbers, or were we part of flattening the curve the way that Lodi was? In other words, did we have any regrets closing down? Okay, well, uh, thanks, Heather. I just uh, I have a follow up question for you. So, do you think that do you do you feel like you have enough data, Heather, to make some of these decisions? Because I agree with you what you said in principle, but the problem is is that I really think that we're acting with no data. Like we have no idea what the denominator is on this on this virus uh, or this illness and, and pandemic. You know, and that's a big deal because we're just basing things off of just haphazard data. Um, and so how did you ultimately, what did you decide to do and what data did you use to make those decisions in terms of your practice decisions? Well, we compared that, um, you know, everybody's talking about flattening of the curve. And so we compared an uncontrolled patient population versus uh, a more controlled population that, and that the numbers really are important when we supersede our number of ICU beds and, and respirators. And, uh, and so if we look at the projections, we can see that the need for respirators are, are far greater than the respirators that we actually have. If we look at the data that's come out of China pretty quickly, uh, I mentioned the science article. And so they were looking at the, um, the, the sources and found that ultimately four sources of, the, of, uh, of infection came from patients that were so mild or asymptomatic that they were not even on the radar. And so when we go to, when we see patients and they're healthy, they, uh, they have no temperature or staph, or even we ourselves we could be contributing to the shedding of the virus and infecting people. And, um, and so because, as you say, Bill, there is so much unknown um, there, I think that the, the risk of continuing as if everybody is virus-free is greater than if we assume that at least some of the people that we bring into our office or work with have the virus, I think that that makes the decision easier. Okay, well, great. Uh, Paco, we're going we're gonna to go to you now. Paco Canales, also in Santa Rosa, uh, knows Heather pretty well uh, as well. <laughs> and uh, Paco, thanks again, and, and uh, lead us off. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, I think um, these are going to be practical tips because I think in a week, maybe two weeks, all of us will be shut down. I think Dave mentioned a number of counties around the Bay Area that was expanded today to Lake County, also Napa County. I know places in Ohio that are shut down. 
so I think in about a week, everybody's going to be shut down. So we assume that and the decisions we make today will will impact the spread of the virus. And I, I think, uh, as been mentioned before, there is no way to uh, somebody was talking about going golfing today. To, uh, and how do you know your buddy doesn't have the virus, even though they may be asymptomatic today, they could be symptomatic tomorrow. So social distancing is important. And I think shutting down our practices is the responsible thing to do. Like I said, Heather and I have been through this before. This is our third rodeo, 2017 fires, 2019 fires, and now this. And so what you need to begin with is have a captain of the team that's usually the surgeon or the surgeons in charge, and then have some co-captains. And so right now we have uh, over 25 employees. So we have a med spa manager as well as a plastic surgery manager, and they're basically responsible for each of their tribe, and their tribe is about 12 each. Uh, what we did during the fires, we started a WhatsApp chat group with all of our employees, and it's free. Almost everybody has a smartphone, whereas not everybody has email that they can access on their, on their phone easily. Um, but the WhatsApp um, chat group has worked really well for us. We can give quick updates on everybody. And those captains or co-captains are sort of the leaders of this team. Uh, practical advice, uh, we're going to all have serious overhead continuing with very little if, if, if or zero income. One of the things that we did, and we just did it uh, this time around again, you can call American Express if you have a platinum card, maybe some of the other cards, the, the black cards, et cetera, can, can do this for you. You can get a penalty-free, interest-free extension for 60 days. American Express already gave us an extension until May 7th, which gets us beyond the, the April 7th shelter in place uh, that we have here in the Bay Area. As far as your bank goes, uh, hopefully you have a credit line or access to a credit line. We doubled our credit line uh, during the 2017 fires, and we added to that during the 2019 fires uh, because there was so much uncertainty. So ideally, you, you should ask your bank for a credit line that can give you three to four months of overhead coverage during this shelter in place. And you can also go to your vendors, uh, McKesson, the, the breast implant vendors, anybody who will listen and ask for a 60-day penalty-free extension on your bills. And many of the vendors have cooperated and helped us out. You can ask your bank to lower your rates on any existing loans. You can try to consolidate loans at today's very low rates. And one thing you should do is have uh, advice of a lawyer. I'm not a labor lawyer. I can't tell you what to do. In California, if you lay employees off, even temporarily, they have certain rights. You have to give them an unemployment booklet. You have to have a specific form. Okay. I think, Heather, can you, uh, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, I don't know how we lost them there for a second. So we can. Uh... Okay. Well, let's let's do this, uh, Blaine. While he's coming back, then we'll let him finish here uh, once once uh, Paco comes back. But um, why don't why don't we why don't you go to the first question? And let's uh, start start getting through some of these. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you all for submitting your questions on the chat. That's still open if you uh, want to continue to do so. Um, so the the first questions we're getting are are um, you had already answered the official stance of ASAPs. The second one was uh, how our practice is handling the payment or benefits of employees. Uh, so if anyone on the panel wants to. Trent, uh, you want to take that? So how, how are you handling uh, benefits and pay, pay to your employees? Currently. Sure, Bill. Uh, so the, the way we decide to handle things for the uh, employees is we got the uh, end date temporarily as April 7th. So looking at uh, a number of factors, including longevity of the staff, uh, loyalty uh, to the practice, uh, we decided that it's in our best interest as a practice and the employee's best interest to pay them their uh, full and regular salary and benefits uh, through that period. At the end of that time, we're going to have to reevaluate and see if uh, people are going to use their PTO, which is probably the next step uh, to extend their pay and benefits. Uh, and then as Paco had mentioned, we talked to the banks with whom we have local relationships here as far as getting uh, credit extended. I think one of the more interesting things, and I 
do not claim to be an expert in this in any matter, regard, but it's the, uh, some of the overhead insurance policies that are out there, whether this is going to qualify as a business interruption and be able to be uh, compensated from an insurance standpoint. I think that is a, uh, a very big question out there, and I don't know that that's been answered by any of the big uh, insurance providers or policyholders yet. So our goal is to try to pay people as much as we can for as long as we can because we need them and want them back uh, when we do get going again. Yeah, and I think that there's also, there was just a, a bill, a uh, law passed, HR like 6201, which has a lot of information in it. Um, but suffice it to say, you know, if you, it's, it's uh, businesses with less than 50 employees are, are exempt from that um, that law. So things do change. Uh, what I would say is that I know that there's a webinar that we're going to be holding on Monday night that will be going into some more of these things too. And I know that that is one thing that we're looking at getting an attorney's interpretation of that, that bill. So if you'd like to, um, particularly for people who have more than 50 employees, you're, you're not exempt. And so you probably uh, might want to tune in in Monday as well. Um, Blaine, are we still missing Paco? Um, that, that I know of, I, I haven't seen them come back up. Uh, okay. so we can, I'll continue to try to connect with them and we'll just go on to the next question if you want. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. My, uh, my insurance has already said no coverage under business interruption clause for governing government actions. I, I guess that sounds like, uh, um, I think people probably need to, um, kind of look at their specific insurance. Um, okay. Um, the, the next question in order of ask was, uh, tell us the basic nuts and bolts of online consultations. Um, so Dave, you, uh, you said you were doing online consultations. What, what can you tell yep. people about that? So uh, in talking with a lot of my colleagues around the country, it seems like there is some uh, variability depending on uh, location. So uh, like I have a friend in uh, Philadelphia, he says a lot of his patients just aren't interested in it, but um, I'm still getting some um, inquiries, not nearly as many as it was the previous weeks, uh, but the people on there want to know if the office is open and then want to know if a virtual consultation is available. So we did a couple things to kind of set that up. Um, I, I can still do them from home on either um, face, uh, FaceTime or through Skype. And then the other thing I have my patient care coordinator do is send them all the intake paperwork so I have that just like a regular patient and then she also um, made a little guide on how to take photos so they're based off the photos I have on my website so if it's a breast augmentation consultation we have the five views and the patient has a, a sheet of paper in their email with the five views that they're supposed to um, supposed to take the photos of and then they email us the photos before the consultation and just by looking at the photos and the intake form, you can usually get a, a pretty good idea whether or not the patient's a good uh, candidate. And then I always tell the patients, I talk to the patients first for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then I take all the notes, I send those to my patient care coordinator who's at home. She puts together a quote, sends them the quote, and then can uh, try to find potential dates uh, at a time that hopefully we're open again. So, Bill, I was just gonna add one thing into the virtual consult thing that we uh, added as well, and it's a little caveat. Uh, in the language, which is uh, before any surgical intervention, uh, an in-person examination is going to be required, and that that may change the nature of the quote and the procedures that are recommended. So I, I think that getting, uh, getting that virtual consultation, that patient contact, the interest in your practice and your offerings, I think that's uh, probably the 80, 90 percent solution, and then that in-person visit is going to be really important so that if there are any adjustments like adding a pexy onto an augmentation or a little lipo onto a tummy tuck, I think that fine tuning uh, can be done at that in-person visit and patients I think just need to be prepared for that, that the price quote may fluctuate a little bit, usually in the upward direction. Uh, so I think good clear communication with the patients in that regards can be really important for us. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree, uh, Trent. And I actually, we've been doing virtual consultations for about 10 years, obviously not doing a vast, you know, not doing a high percentage versus in, in person, uh, but they are very effective. We do it very similar to what um, Dave, Sieber, and, and Trent uh, just, just described. So they, they can work very well. Okay, Paco, 
Hey, I'm here. Can you hear? All right, full throttle, man. You're back. Okay, Excellent. full throttle. Put it um, back on. All right, so let's get back to Paco and let him finish up. Okay, so uh, I don't know where I left off, but again, here, here's the slide. So ask the bank if they can lower your existing loans um, using a labor lawyer because California has very strict things, and I'm sure other states also do. And, you know, we made the decision to temporarily lay off 20, 21 employees so they could qualify for unemployment and food stamps. You know, we may go back to that bill that, that Trent was alluding to. We may pay those two weeks or three weeks until April 7th, but that's to be decided. Somebody, yeah, one of the employees said, please write me a layoff right now so I can apply for food stamps. So we did. Next slide. So look carefully at your bills, make sure you stop things that you don't need. Uh, you know, we, we all have recurrent things that, that we don't think about, whether it's janitorial or laundry, et cetera, just stop it. Uh, and look at your credit card for those recurring things that you may be able to stop. And certainly consider reducing or pausing the marketing for cosmetic procedures. It's just terrible optics, like I saw today on Instagram, people advertising breast augmentation, BBLs, cool sculpting in the middle of this expanding pandemic, and this is just not right. Uh, so maintain staff morale. Uh, we do that through the chat. We, we can't get together, uh, but we talk all the time on the chat room. And I think we all have to be prepared for more than a two-week closure. This may be a two- to four-month closure, if not longer, and we all need to conserve cash and try to survive. So that's all I have to say. I think uh, the decisions we make today will impact the future, and I think we're doing the right thing by shutting down. Uh, Paco, one, one question on... Uh one of your your uh, points. So in terms of when you when you looked at the credit card getting a, a 60 day interest free extension for paying that you, you just call the number on the back of the credit card or do you have to reach a certain department or how does that work? No, it was kind of crazy. I just called the number on the back of the credit card and I just explained the, my, the situation. I said we had a shelter in place, everything is shut down. And I wanted to do that, and they said no problem. I mean, they, and they didn't even transfer me, so they just said, "I'm going to put a note on your account that your account is protected." What that means is, is that you won't be charged any interest or penalty. And and they gave me to the end of the second cycle, which gets us to May 7th. Uh, so that really is going to buy some time because we put everything on on our credit card. We put in implants and we put in office supplies. Uh, as, uh, everything that we can on that credit card and therefore we don't have to pay it. So it really just buys us time until we can maybe get back in the office and generate some income from the med spa and also from, um, uh, from surgery. And then also on maintaining your staff morale, what, do you have any specific techniques or examples that, that uh, you're using or think are important for people to think about? Yeah, I mean, everybody's talking about just having a, a video chat where we all have a drink together or have coffee together. Uh, those things can be done pretty pretty easily with the things that the the apps that we have today. Uh, so I think just maintaining that communication, you can put stuff into the WhatsApp uh, chat. Today we put in that our local bank was extending car loan payments for three months without any penalty uh, or, or, or additional interest or any, or any sort of black mark on your credit score. So those kinds of things can be put in there. One of our nurses decided she wanted to donate blood in case there's a need for blood and she put down where, where she was going and another member joined in. So those kinds of things kind of keep people involved and, and um, keep people sort of hopeful so that we can return as soon as possible. Yeah, those are great points. Um, you know, Blaine, I don't want to put you in the spot, but thank, uh, thanks again for troubleshooting this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, in real time, this has been great having Blaine because actually with these little technical glitches, it can really bring down the program. But I think uh, with his expertise, it went great. But, you know, Blaine, I just thought it'd be, I mean, Sientra went through some rough times. So not the exact same thing. It wasn't, you know, coronavirus. It was other things. But you have any insights that we could use it in this uh, now that you guys uh, used in, in with Sientra with your your issues? Yeah, um, thanks, Bill. Uh, so as you guys all know, we lost our manufacturing in the uh, end of 2015, and so we were out for six months uh, without an ability to sell. Uh, the world went on without us, but we had to cover a lot of the same issues. Uh, luckily, we're a large corporation, so we had cash to cover our employees, and and they did. Uh, um, Dr. Furness, if you could, uh, there, I got gotcha. you. 
Um, so it, it, it was really important to keep the team engaged uh, during that time. That's the first and foremost is that whenever we get back from this, you need to keep at least your most um, vital employees, not only on staff, but engaged. Uh, so that's really important. That's part of what led to us being uh, here on this call. Um, and then also, uh, you know, is just making sure that you have continual communication with them, um, not only engagement in terms of staff training, but, but also that you're communicating directly with them because uh, people can obviously um, fall off. And, and the worst thing to do would be to allow uh, people to kind of uh, go look for a different job. You don't know that and then it's time to come back and now you have less staff than you thought and you're ready to go. Uh, if you don't mind, I, I'd plug um, our practice management consultant uh, who's on staff here for Sientra Enhance, uh, Sandy Roos. Uh, she will actually be doing a, a lot of practice management uh, skills training both for staff as well as for surgeons during this downtime. Uh, so, Sandy, if you're on and, and you want to uh, talk about your plans for uh, engaging people during this time, uh, please, please uh, unmute. Maybe I'll try to unmute her. Yeah, let's see if, um, if we can get Sandy on, we'll have her comment. In the interim, uh, I'm Trent and Dave Sieber, if you guys could comment on this, so this is a question, you know, in terms of what about guidance for, you know, so-called elective breast reconstruction procedures. Is that different? Uh, say it's at a, a, a surgery center uh, that's not taking up hospital beds. Do, do you have any different advice uh, or what would you, what's your advice on that specific situation? Well, it looks like there was some other questions in the chat and Ann Pellet who's on here as well. She's another um, surgeon here in San Francisco. She said that the surgery centers and hospitals here in the Bay Area are only allowing urgent procedures, cancer and fractures, no elective recon. Yeah, hi, it's Ann. Um, I just wanted to say the way that our surgery center put it out, and I think it makes a ton of sense, is that all the cases that we're doing take PPE from healthcare workers who are gonna need it. So I think when you put it in that vein, I mean, I, I'm a breast cancer and a breast reconstruction surgeon. I got all my breast cancer cases done this week. I canceled all my recon. And I think we need to save our PPE for the right people. So that's kind of the guidance that we're getting from here. And that's what most, what? Of, the, um, most of the mandates, I think, are for resource allocation. It's not, um, and that seems to be the main thing. I mean, there is always a risk of uh, transmitting the virus. But I think the main reason that a lot of these are stopping, just like Dan said, is for resource allocation. You know, I think one thing, and this is Paco talking again, uh, Dirk uh, Richter from ISAPS, who's the president, said at this point is beyond resource allocation, that everything that we use in our elective procedures could have been needed uh, for the main hospital. So it, it, it's really, um, the, the resources are going to get outstripped pretty soon. I think anybody who thinks that they can continue to operate by tightening precautions, limiting staff, uh, not seeing a lot of patients, et cetera, are fooling themselves. So you don't know who has the virus. It's not like you can say, oh, I think they don't have a temp or they don't have a sniffle. Every, uh, everybody, and I think uh, Sanjay Gupta said this, treat it like everybody has the virus, including yourself, and then you will really understand the problem. Right, and I think that what I saw on CNN today was the California governor, uh, Bill alluded to it earlier, but trying to make decisions on data, I don't know the validity of this particular data, but the California governor estimated that uh, just over 50% of Californians will probably be exposed or have the virus in the next four to eight weeks, uh, which if you put that in numbers is about 25 million people. So that's a, a lot of PPE and that's a lot of resources that need to be allocated and hopefully we'll be able to get the, the shipments of those things into the major uh, population centers to take care of that. Yeah, there's some people that believe that there's already that number of people that would be positive if you tested everybody. So it's um, um, a lot of unknowns for sure. Um, okay, let's, let's keep going on our um, questions. Blaine, what was the next one? Yeah, the, the next one, actually, there's a question specifically for Dr. Douglas. Uh, I agree, is that, agree, agree with the telemedicine being important, but what makes him think potential patients will see cosmetic consults given the virus situation and the market crashing? Uh, so, and, and that's related to other questions or uh, was also, you know, as we move forward and this is kind of ongoing and rolling, you know, how the group is going to transition back into surgery. Is that a gradual 
or we jump in knowing that the virus will still be around when the shelter is over? Uh, well, Blaine, I think that there are a couple of ways to phase back in. So, for example, the patients that were already scheduled who had paid their fees, they, there was really not much of an interest in people canceling. They were more than happy to reschedule. Uh, during the early phase of all of this, I would say that's probably in the 7 to 10, 14 days ago at this point, uh, when people were just looking at, hey, my company's closing, I'm going to have a couple weeks uh, unexpected off work. The phones really started to ring. It picked up. I want to come in for a consultation. I want to you know, sign up for surgery tomorrow so I can have this uh, procedure done and recover while I'm off from work. So without trying to appear opportunistic, uh, we said, well, this might not be too bad for our line of work and our business. And then everything changed on Monday when the San Francisco mayor came out and put out the shelter in place order. So that's where we really put our staff to work as far as uh, contacting the patients, getting things down and uh, seeing an abdominoplasty consult last week. And uh, what you'd mentioned, people with uh, uh, otherwise really good sound uh, financial status. Um, she said, well, I've got all the time in the world now to do it, but my husband says our net worth is 50% uh, of what it was last week, so I'm going to have to hold off. So I, I do think that some of the volatility in the markets and uncertain economic times may impact things when we, uh, when we get back and rolling again. I don't think this is a forever problem, and I think that we'll be through this um, from a virus standpoint in the next four to six months, hopefully, uh, with hopefully a good return of economic indicators and people uh, resuming what they're ordinarily planning to do anyway. Yeah, I think those are good points. And I think the other thing that <clears throat> is going to evolve, and it's a daily, it's a dynamic process, but, you know, the more data is going to come out, I, ju I just think we have so little understanding of the actual data of this. The more we understand, the more we're going to be able to scientifically make certain decisions about these mm -hmm. things. Uh, I mean, you heard today there's a, now an FDA-approved treatment for CVD-19, chloroquine. Um, that, all, all those things change the game. Same thing in terms of when vaccines come out. So there's, a, I think a lot of things will change even next week. We'll talk about this. We'll probably have a totally different opinion. So I think you just have to stay on top of it, stay in touch. And uh, that's really probably the best, best practice. Uh, okay. Uh, what's next, Blaine? I think, I think the next one that probably requires some good discussion here um, is, is there a sense that the state or local authorities may take possession of the ventilators and supplies um, from independent office sur surgery facilities um, as the ventilators in the hospitals become overwhelmed. Uh, hey. Paco? There was talk about that. Man, <clears throat> excuse me, converting our anesthesia machines into ventilators, et cetera. I think it really depends on where you are in the country. There are some areas that may become completely outstripped and they will come out and, you know, they have a list of who's a quad ASF facility, so it's not like you can go ahead and hide and, and, and it, you know, they know what you have in, in, in storage. So it may come to that. I, I hope it doesn't. Uh, but I know in Italy, when everything got outstripped, they, they just get their hands on anything they can. Yeah, so it's certainly in northern Italy and certain Lombardy, I think the areas that were have the highest number of cases, that's where they had really mm -hmm. out, outpaced their, um, their health care system. Uh, but certainly other areas of Italy have not uh, gotten to that. So I, I think I would agree that it will be geographically dependent. Um, and again, we just don't know, you know, we don't really know what, what, what's in store for us in the next, um, you know, couple weeks. All right. What, what's next, Blaine? Well, I, I think uh, just, just worthy of verbalization is the uh, comment from uh, Stephen Karp. Uh, he says, uh, we're all in this together, help each other. When we get back to normal, if a surgeon needs OR time, help them get it. If you have an ACS or, or office based center, offer it to use. I, I think that's a great point that, you know, as a society, as a um, community here, that as we get back into a place where we can start back into surgery, that um, we're all one market, we can keep the competitive stuff down and just help each other get back the, the rising title float all boats. Uh, mentality as we come back. So I, I think that's worthy of, of uh, saying. Um, let me pull up the other questions from before. I think we got probably three more minutes, uh, Blaine, just to get to finish okay. on, on the hour. Yeah, I think the last one maybe just for discussion is um, curious on a vote from those attending the webinar, 
what is safer, staying minimally open for surgery or staying minimally open for injectables right now? You guys have partially covered that. Um, but if you want to just comment finally on, on you know, following uh, each individual laws in your own discretion. Paco, why well, don't you I start? Think, yeah, I will start with saying, saying partially open makes absolutely no sense. I mean, you are exposing every single person to a potential COVID uh, you're exposing your staff, and what are you getting? You're getting, you know, a thousand bucks a day, or ten thousand bucks a week, or whatever. That that's not going to help in the long run if we have to shut down for four months. But shutting down completely, hashtag stay home. That's basically what they're saying. People in World War II uh, went to war. All we have to do is stay home, and it's a financial hit, and we're all going to take it. But the sooner we go to the Lodi mo mode instead of the Bergamo mode, we're going to flatten the curve and do our, our duty. So I think staying partially open makes no sense to me. Dave, thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, I think when, um, well, when the shelter in place mandate first came about, uh, I, you know, there's a lot to think about. What do I do? How am I going to make money? How long is this going to last? Um, and the more I thought about it, uh, I mean, we're all physicians, and it really has to do with patient safety. And, and Bill, I totally agree with you. Uh, we don't know what these numbers are. We really have no idea what the numerator or the denominator are. Um, but uh, I have to kind of trust, and this might sound scary, trust the government to some degree that they probably have a better idea of what's going on than we do. Um, so if they want us to stay inside and isolate, I, I don't, like Pagan said, I don't think there's any reason to be exposing other people uh, just to make a few dollars doing injectables. Trent, any, uh, any other comments on that? No, I think I agree with both Paco and Dave. Uh, we had this very, very deliberate, very spirited discussion in our office. Uh, it's the dichotomy of aesthetic medicine of it is a for-profit business where this is how we provide the livelihood to ourselves and to our families and our staff. Uh, but when it came right down to it, we decided to go with the physician first, uh, public and patient staff and self-safety is the answer and decide to close down for everything. Uh, on the what Blaine had mentioned earlier, I think one of the things that's really important is camaraderie right now. It meant the world to me that I could get on the phone and talk to Paco just up the road the other day. Hey, what are you guys doing? Your practice about the same size we are. And then with no BS, without any hawing or hemming, Paco sent information within five minutes uh, that really helped us make some big decisions as well. So I think that spirit of cooperation and camaraderie should be out there for all of us. That's great. Um, okay, before I make a couple of concluding remarks, I, Blaine, anything else on your end or anything that uh, you like to add? And again, you know, really thank you guys for your uh, your help and letting us put this on and actually the series of webinars, which I'll um, uh, mention when we close. Great. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to partner with you guys on this. And Sientra obviously is very dedicated to uh, you guys. Our, our company lives and die by your success. So um, you know, in regards to the comments that are just made, I think all of us partnering together as best as we can. Uh, we are planning our own series of, uh, like I said, practice management stuff. So if you guys are interested in that, contact your Sientra representative locally. Uh, there was also the question or comment about um, contacting implant manufacturers to furlough your, your payments. Um, you know, that's a case by case basis. Definitely uh, just communicate with your representative. We're gonna do everything we absolutely can if there's stuff that's outstanding bills for past cases um, and you can pay those, that's fine. If there's stuff for, that's been ordered in and you have implants on your shelves, you don't need to worry about sending those back to make sure you get it off your books. We're not gonna come collecting those. Keep the implants where they are so that when we get back running, you guys can uh, serve your patients as quick as possible. Um, and then uh, lastly, for, for all attendees here, obviously this is a group discussion. We originally set this with a panel of San Francisco uh, plastic surgeons because they were hardest hit early when we scheduled this only a couple of days ago and look how much it's changed already just in the chat you can see the updates state by state hour by hour are closing down so this is an ongoing conversation um, to, to Dr. Adams point so we're going to have um, plenty of resources both Sientra and ASAPs uh, available to you so with that thank you guys for allowing us to be a part of um, you know your lives. Thank you again. Thanks to Sientra. Uh, just as con concluding remarks, I'd really like to thank our, our panelists. So uh, Paco, Heather, Dave, and Trent. 
uh, really, really great information. I know we didn't get to every single question that everybody has, and there's going to be many, many more. Um, the good news is that if there's anybody that didn't see this, um, we will post this through the Aesthetic Society. Uh, it'll probably be available within the hour. Uh, and the other thing is, is that this is the first of a series of kind of emergency educational webinars that we're putting on as uh, for this on behalf of the Aesthetic Society. The next one will be on Monday. This will be at 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. It's called Practice Management During a Pandemic, Common Issues That Affect All of Us. Uh, it's going to be led by Robert Singer, Mark Jewell, Ryan Miller, and Mary Jewell. Um, so I think you'll, again, be able to glean a lot of very useful information. Uh, and again, that'll be assisted by uh, Sientra. So thanks again, everybody. Just uh, as we say at the State of Society, our motto, full throttle. And uh, remember, it's uh, uh, of the people, for the people, and by the people. So good night and good luck.